Doc Danger and the Danger Squad, Part 1, Something to Read. The pages of the near-century-old magazine were so fragile they threatened to disintegrate if so much as breathed on too hard. The cover was frayed and bore the ravages of time, yet the lurid illustration nonetheless lit a spark in her imagination, its melodramatic tableau struggling to be seen through a haze of time-worn yellow fadedness and a web of wrinkles and creases. The title splashed across the top was rendered in large, unevenly spaced letters, Breathtaking Tales. Just below the date stamp, November of 1933, the issue was labeled number 17. The kid took a comfortable place on the couch and carefully set the magazine down in front of her. She once again scrutinized the cover image, fascinated by its somewhat obsolete prurience, its attempt to shock the sensibilities of an era that was already long past, well before she herself had been born. In the background of the tableau, a skinny, tuxedo-clad man with a pencil-thin mustache was bent nearly backwards, his face twisted in a sinister rictus of sadistic laughter. At his feet, a gray-furred cat was sitting, looking up at its master affectionately. In the foreground, a well-tanned blonde woman sat in a gleaming metal chair. The shirt she wore was badly shredded, Indeed, the damage so extensive that it was a mystery as to how the piece of clothing still stayed on. The heroine's impressive musculature struggled against the ropes that kept her lashed to the seat, and her mouth was an O of astonishment as she eyed an intravenous cable, one end of which was sticking sloppily into her upper arm, while the other end was connected to a bag that dangled from an irrigation tower. The bag itself was black, emblazoned garishly with a skull and crossbones, so that no one might mistake the pestilential nature of the liquid contained therein. A blocky, mechanical figure stood nearby, menace exuding improbably from its dead, perfectly circular eyes. It seemed quite prepared, on the off chance that the blonde woman might manage to free herself from bondage, to attack her and force her back onto the chair by means of the jointed tubular limbs that sprouted unnaturally from its cylindrical torso. Just below the magazine's bombastic logo, a caption proclaimed, Doc Danger faces Professor Z's revenge. At the lower right-hand corner, meanwhile, an orange rectangle excitedly promised other thrills. The Lady in Black, Cowgirls on the Moon, The Jaguar Princess Meets the Beetle Queen. Taking care not to damage the brittle pages of this fascinating artifact, the kid gingerly lifted the magazine open to an arbitrarily chosen page, and the aroma of dust and age crept quickly into her nostrils. Behind her glasses, she squinted to discern the now light gray words, which seemed in danger of fading completely from the darkly yellowed paper on which they'd been printed nearly nine decades hence. She found herself jumping around from one paragraph to another, diving into the magazine's assorted narratives at points in the middle rather than the beginning. She skipped forward or turned back as the mood struck her. From the tale of a jungle princess's struggle against an evil demon priestess, to a story about two cowgirls entrusted with a famous composer whose safety was threatened by a lunar bandit called Penny Dreadful. As often happened when she immersed herself in some new reading matter, the girl subconsciously vocalized a simple sing-song melody, which occasionally altered itself to more closely match the adventures unfolding on the page and in her mind's eye. Taking Tales, Issue 17 Josiah of the Jaguars hunts the Beetle Queen She tracks the villainess all alone To retrieve a mystic gemstone But the Beetle Queen catches her unawares And traps her within the spell of crimson squares On the edge of a molten lava moat Ha ha, she is hurt to go Josiah, I must confess that I am glad you're here, oh yes. 
I've acquired the gemstone of Zavenu, but there's something more I wanted to do, my darling, can you guess? For I could not assess this job to be complete unless, in addition to claiming my mystical prize, I could also claim credit for your demise, my jungle princess, my favorite jungle princess. You only defeated me via treacherous magic, Beetle Queen, revealing yourself as a true villain. You broke the law of the jungle, which states, never cheat, never lie, never stab your foe in the back. Never stab your foe in the back. Yes, yes. Must you repeat this litany every time we confront each other, my pretty jaguar princess? So what will you do now, vile sorceress? Hurl me into this moat of molten lava? <laughs> Eventually. But it's not enough for me to simply rob you of your mortal existence. You're such a clever little savage, after all. You would reclaim your physical shell somehow given half the chance. So I'll bind your soul in a prison spell woven by a demon's dance. Despite the queen's threats, Josai stands fast. Stoic and stern, although she is only minutes away from being cast into inferno eternally. Such edge of the sea, now biting scenes, dramatic, thrilling, and bold. Surely breathtaking tales, issue 17, the most breathtaking tale ever told. Magnetized railway on the moon, Penny dreadful shackles Claire de Lune, while holding a hostage with her laser gun, one Robert von Hesslington. At Garden Mispella, you sure did fail, some security escort you turned out to be. Enjoy your last moments on this Magna Rail. She giggles with vicious glee. Form a final breath of favor from you, a petition. Well, sure, I reckon that that's fair. Simply tell me why, of all things, you would kidnap a musician. Well, that's a very complicated question, Claire. I was sworn to keep that secret by my coalition. And so your poser puts me in a difficult position. Let's simply say I'm hiring him to write a new commission. But you'll be dead in minutes, so why should you care? Excuse me if my understanding's correct. You mean to assign me a task? Well, if that's the case, then I must object to the way you've chosen to ask. Ask? I'm telling not asking, buckaroo. You're gonna compose me a song. It ain't no choice I'm offering you. So little doggy, let's get along. So Claire is left alone at the magnetic Station Galdar, the train is on its way. But luckily, her partner happens on the situation. Yes, satellite Sally's come without delay. Looks like somebody's got you hogtied, little sidekick. Let's have ourselves a look. Sally moves to free her sidekick, but she soon realizes the handcuffs are a chromium and art amalgamation. The lock is programmed with a 20 digit combination. So Sally grows frustrated and she bellows. Tarnation! Figuring this out is gonna take all day. I'm not sure we have all day, ma'am. Such edge of the sea, now biting scenes, dramatic, thrilling, and bold. Surely breathtaking tales, issue 17, the most breathtaking tale ever told.
gets into a below ground lair But soon is caught in a surprising snare A booby trap set by Professor Z Who now chuckles villainously <laughs> Wow, there's a lot of women getting tied up in these stories So, the mighty Doc Danger brought low at last you may as well release me now, Professor Z. Is that so, Danger? And why, pray tell? Because if you don't, I'll escape anyway. I always escape. You have been awfully fortunate in that regard, haven't you? But statistically speaking, your luck simply must run out eventually. I have a feeling today's the day. So it goes, Danger. Heaven knows, Danger, why you chose Danger to invade my enclave. Danger, now be brave. Brave danger, you're in grave danger, I'm afraid. It's a shock, danger, how you mock danger. Maybe Doc Danger never learns. Now you'll deal danger with some real danger. Can you feel danger? How it burns. This tube is feeding you drip by drip. A custom-made viral disease. Now I'll cruise away in a luxury ship. You will die by degrees. Such edge of the sea, mill biting seas, dramatic, thrilling, and bold. Surely breathtaking tales, issue 17, the most breathtaking tale ever told. Doc Danger and the Danger Squad, Part 2, The Origin of Doc Danger, Who She Is and How She Came to Be. Enjoy your final moments, Danger. The professor gloated in triumph. Damn it, her arch nemesis, known only by the monogrammatical moniker Z, had gotten the drop on her. Now her bicep tingled as though she could feel each individual droplet of his toxin as it entered her bloodstream with intravenous inexorability. Doc Danger struggled against the ropes which held her fast in the trap that Professor Z had constructed. She could feel them give ever so slightly against the power of her chemically augmented musculature, but she knew it would take time before the cordage would snap entirely, allowing her to tear the IV tube free and apprehend the immaculately dressed villain who stood smirking in the opposite corner of the chamber. Unfortunately, Professor Z seemed only seconds away from vacating his headquarters, in effect, abandoning her to her fate. She spoke with a confident authority that belied the precariousness of her present situation. You're leaving? Why bother to kill me slowly if you're not going to savor it? That doesn't seem to fit your sadistic profile, Professor. Hmm, you know me so well, Danger. MC6! From an adjoining chamber, Danger could hear a regular clanging thud that grew steadily louder in volume. Through an arched entranceway soon emerged the source of the sound, the slow, purposeful footsteps of an apparently fully automated, upright walking mechanical creature, seemingly composed entirely of metal. The gray humanoid stared at her with circular yellow eyes. Below those eyes was a hinged jaw that worked silently, suggesting the automaton might be capable of speech, though at the moment it said nothing. It simply stood ominously, its eyes never blinking, as they seemed to take in the entirety of her physicality. Professor Z spoke once more. My loyal robotic servitor is equipped with a film apparatus. MC6 will record all your violent death throes on her internal magnetic strip, which I will be able to view later, over and over again, at my leisure. You're as clever as you are disturbed, Z. Flattery will get you nowhere. Enjoy MC6's company. She doesn't say much, but she's quite steadfast. Now, I have a ship to catch. Oh, 
and I'll be keeping these blueprints, although I'm sure your friend Dr. Gilbert is missing them. <laughs> Au revoir, Doc Danger! The professor then scooped up his pet cat and briskly exited via the same portal through which MC6 had entered moments before. Meanwhile, the robot itself took two more steps toward her, as though to silently emphasize the hazard it posed. She strained once again at the ropes that cut so savagely into her bare arms and legs. They gave a little further. Poison continued to make its way into her veins, one tiny globule after another. If she could just hold out a bit longer. She looked up at the mechanical figure before her and smiled. Hey there, robot friend, in your metal plating. Do you mind if I bend your ear? While we're waiting for my life to end in spasmodic violence, I intend not to spend my time in silence. So let me regale you with my little tale of who I am and how I came to be. It's expository, my breathtaking story of who I am and how I came to be. Raised by my aunt, I was a sickly child, a genius savant, but weak, meek, and mild. My peers would taunt me, they were unforgiving, frill and gaunt, I didn't want to go on living. Eventually, I was filled with burning curiosity, so I started learning about chemistry. And before much longer, I had the key to making me so much stronger. Thanks to my mind, my body was redefined. And that's who I am and how I came to be. Now, let me get specific. My method scientific. Are who I am and how I came to be. I concocted a chemical pill that cured my body of every ill. It augmented my mind and physique and brought my strength level to its peak. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And one more benefit today confirms I'm immune to all toxic germs. My brain advanced. Physicality enhanced, and that's who I am and how I came to be. Synapse and sinew, sublime both out and in you. Know who I am and how I came to be. From my muscles right down to my red cord puzzles, and that's who I am and how I came to be. And that's who I am and how I came to be. And that's who I am and how. Doc Danger is brought to you in part by Paris Dentistry, conveniently located at 225 East Michigan Street in downtown Milwaukee. Dr. David Paris and his exceptional staff provide cosmetic and family dentistry for adults and children. For more information, visit parisdentistry.com or call 414-272-7747. That's 414-272-7747. Seven seven four seven, and now back to Doc Danger and the Danger Squad. Doc Danger's chest rose and fell; her breathing heavy in the aftermath of the violence. Her fists, which had so efficiently reduced MC Six to scrap metal, one powerful blow at a time, remained clenched at her sides, and sweat covered every inch of her tanned, athletic frame. She was still coming down from the adrenaline rush when the kid came rushing into the chamber. Doc, you're okay! The kid took in the tableau. There was Doc Danger herself, clothed in combat boots, cargo shorts, a tank top, and tooled leather gloves, her every limb throbbing with scientifically enhanced strength. To the left, 
There was the silver chair, surrounded by fragments of snapped rope. To the right, the disabled mechanical creature and the toppled irrigation tower. And finally, the solution bag on the floor, now torn, its septic contents slowly seeping onto the red tiles. The kid stared at it all, wide-eyed. Then she adjusted her cap and exclaimed, Holy crumbs, a robot! Danger sighed with accustomed exasperation. Kid, I told you to wait on the surface. Aw, come on, Doc. When I saw Professor Z leave and then you didn't come out after him, I got worried. As a member of the Danger Squad, it was my duty to bust in and rescue you. <sighs> For the last time, there is no Danger Squad. There's me, and then there's a kid who follows me around. Besides, I didn't need any help. The day I can't take down some two-bit robot is the day Doc Danger packs it in. Gosh, you said it, Doc. Unfortunately, that criminal weasel has still got William's plans. Oh, since when do you call Dr. Gilbert William? He's a friend and a colleague. A very handsome friend, and of all his fellow colleagues, he called you when his antimatter machine blueprints got stolen. Lose the anti, kid. It's a matter phase modulator, and it's not something we want Professor Z creating. Now, before he fled, he mentioned a ship. If I leave now, maybe I can beat him to the harbor. The kid watched with intense admiration as her idol and mentor sprang into action once more, the doc's long and sinewy legs propelling her speedily from this innermost chamber of Professor Z's hideout. Oh, yeah! Go get him, doc! Danger Squad, mobilize! La 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 Doc Danger and the Danger Squad Part three, the cowgirls and the magno train. Claire de Lune sighed inwardly, but kept her temper. The magnets which propelled lunar locomotives across the surface of the moon were so finely calibrated that the vehicles didn't even touch the tracks. Nevertheless, Claire was certain she could feel a rumbling vibration becoming more insistent by the moment. As she lay prostrate across the steel track, her ankles and wrists figuratively hog-tied by Penny Dreadful's insidious electric manacles, she could do nothing but stare upward toward her partner. This dang blamed circuitry sure is finicky. Satellite Sally spoke with frustration. She had removed a small panel from the holster of her laser-charged pistol. The cowgirl now held the gun gingerly in one hand, and the fingers of the other were digging around the interior of the unit, a little clumsily for Claire's taste. She willed herself to remain calm and said, Remember, unplug the yellow wire, but leave the green one in place. I got it, I got it. Sure wish I had some tweezers or some such. If you could hurry it along, ma'am. The Magno train don't seem to be slowing up none. Just one or two more minutes. I'm pretty sure we've only got seconds, ma'am. Hold those horses, little buddy. I just about got it. Okay, polarity is reversed. This here laser gun is now a bona fide electronic lock descrambler. Yeehaw! Ready? Aim! Now, ma'am, now! Fire! <laughs> Much obliged for the rescue, ma'am. <laughs> that was fun. <laughs> but now, can you tell me what's going on? How'd you let that Penny Dreadful Varmint get the drop on you, Claire? Shucks, I don't know. I sure wish you'd been here with me on this bodyguarding job, Sally. That might have made the difference. Well, now just cool your rocket jets, little buddy. You're still the sidekick, remember? I'm in charge. And sometimes I've got to delegate. I had plenty of things on my plate this weekend, too, you know. You mean your camping trip with that rancher fella down by Crater Lake? How'd that go, by the way? Well, little buddy... It could have gone better. <laughs> I tell you, Claire, these rancher types are tough, but sometimes I wish I could meet a man that was smart and sensitive, you know? I suppose. From the holster at her left side, Claire retrieved a small, handheld device and studied the data that appeared on its tiny rectangular view screen. Oh, looks like the tracker I put on Von Hesslington is working real fine. We can follow him to wherever it is that dreadful is taking him. 
That's a handy contraption, sure shooting. All right, clear the loon and lead the way. Your wish is my command, Satellite Sally. Yeehaw! The Team Supreme is reunited and on the hunt. Just another typical day for a pair of cowgirls on the moon. We're cowgirls on the moon. Satellite Sally and Claire to loon. Bowling bandits in tranquility. ring and took down the villainous vulture king. I got nicked by his right wing. Whoa, that one still sure to sting. We're cornered black hole Bart's black ship on that old mercury airstrip. Since then I've got one bad hip from the bullet with the mercury tip. We're cowgirls on the moon. Satellite Sally and clear to loon. Confronting crooks and craters near a crescent shapes and dune. Robot alone on Jupiter's red spot. I've still got a gnarly knot from where I took some laser shots. Oh, we're cruising in our rocket cars after criminals who fled to Mars. I've still got some mental scars from the drinks they serve in those Mars bars. We're cowgirls on the moon. Satellites, Sally and Claire to lose. With a friendship that you can't eclipse and fuck you can't impute. We're cowgirls. Cowgirls on the moon And we're taking off through starry skies On another enterprise Like when we fought that armored knight In the valley of Neptune's triton That got practice dirty fighting I still have tape marks from his bite Or lick that giant Venusian bee In a hive and a hive Venusian tree. I still owe the hospital a fee for feeding me intravenously. Or caught a titan of titanium on Uranus mining on Obtania. I still feel clouds inside my cranium from exposure to uranium. We're, We're taking off through starry skies on another enterprise. Kind of starting to despise cause it's always me who nearly dies. We're cowgirls on the Duck Danger is brought to you in part by Be Spectacled. Located at 7511 Harwood Avenue, in the heart of the Wauwatosa Village, Be Spectacled offers both exceptional eye care and exquisite eye wear for all your vision needs. To find out more, visit bespectacledeyes.com. Be Spectacled. Optometry and good-looking frames. And now, back to Duck Danger and and the Danger Squad. Doc Danger and the Danger Squad, Part 4. The Beetle Queen and the Crown of Zavenu. The heat of the volcano was like a physical force that beat upon Josiah's bare limbs, leaving them slick with perspiration. Mere inches away, towering in triumph, the terrifyingly beautiful Beetle Queen held the diadem of Zavenu between two slender clawed fingers. The witch was so close that a right hook from the jungle princess would have knocked her cold, except that Jazai could not move a muscle. The bizarre, other-dimensional bands of crimson light, arranged in perfect squares of various sizes, which now hovered about the two women, casting them and their craggy surroundings in shades of scarlet, also robbed Josiah of any physical agency. In her mind's eye, she could picture exactly what she wanted to do, the moves her body must make in order to overpower and defeat her enemy. But her body refused to cooperate. 
held frozen in place by arcane energies. She had control of her eyes, her ears, her voice. She could see her foe, hear every word of the queen's nauseating braggadocio, growl and hurl invective at the woman. But that was all. The Beetle Queen, meanwhile, resplendent in her shimmering, skin-hugging, chitinous armor, was relishing her moment of ascendancy. She continued to admire the diadem she held, and, more importantly, the obsidian jewel set within the ancient mystical crown, as she spoke to Josai with smug self-satisfaction. It's beautiful, isn't it? The diadem once worn by the legendary Emperor Zavinu himself. It is a desecration, sorceress, as you well know. To remove the crown of Zavinu from its resting place here in the heart of this volcano is to invite destruction upon the entire world. Oh, ever the melodramatic one. But then who am I to judge, given that I've just conjured a demon to weave a dance that will damn your soul for all of eternity? <laughs> the razor-sharp nails at the end of the queen's fingers traced magical sigils in the air. The stench of brimstone assaulted Josiah's nostrils, and suddenly a third figure now occupied the volcanic cave. Hunched and hideous, the demon seemed to shimmer in the heat haze. The queen scratched affectionately behind one of the creature's pointed ears, and its prehensile tail shivered in pleasure. The demon locked eyes with the jungle warrior, and Josiah could feel a slight tug upon her spirit, as if it were attempting to fly free of its mortal shell. Putting aside the peril to her own soul, the jaguar princess began to plead with her enemy. If not for my sake, then for your own, Beetle Queen, I beg of you. Do not attempt to tap into the power of the onyx gemstone set within that crown. It will only bring about apocalypse. Ah, jungle princess. As beautiful as you are, I must say you do go on at length. I grow bored. And besides, I have a ship to catch. Farewell, Josiah of the Jaguars. <laughs> Still frozen in place by the crimson squares, the jungle princess could do nothing but watch while her carapace-covered foe departed the superheated cave. Josiah's powerful limbs still refused to obey her as the hunched satanic creature that the queen had left in her stead began a strange, hypnotic, soul-ensnaring dance. The jaguar princess's own heart was beating furiously, but with futility within her chest. The rhythms of the jungle match the beatings of my heart. Blood burns through each vein as I feel the pain of failure tearing me apart. I have lost the diadem Now for myself I sing this requiem The passions of the jungle match the fervor of my mind As I agonize tears burn in my eyes Threatening to make me blind For I have lost the onyx gem Now for myself I sing this requiem When I was a child, feral, mad and wild Wandering through some lost and lonely sector Jungle's very shade, her ghost, her spirit, her noble soul, her specter. She fed me from her vines and quenched my thirst with wines as sweet and fine as any earthly nectar. And now that I am grown, it is I and I alone who have sworn in turn to be her own protector.
success I owe her no less for all the succor she once gave Instead, I hear her voice condemn For humanity will soon drown in mayhem So not just for myself, but as well for all of them I sing this melancholy Jesai of the Jaguars knew that she had only seconds before her immortal spirit was entirely sucked away by the forces the creature had summoned through its demoniacal dance. The creature itself knew it as well. It smiled a toothy smile, its forked tongue darting in and out as it wrung its hands in anticipation of the soul on which it would soon dine. Jesai blinked sweat from her eyes, prepared to meet her fate unflinchingly, and was suddenly surprisingly aware of an inky silhouette that seemed to have been poured silently into existence just behind the demon. In an instant, a pair of sleek, sable-gloved arms were wrapped around the monster's head. There was a sickening crack, and the brute's body went limp. The dusky arms loosened their grip, and the demon's lifeless corpse thudded to the ground. The shadowed figure stepped forward, she was clothed head to toe in Stygian shades, a vision in ebony, a raven-haired angel rendered in charcoal. Her jet leather boots stepped efficiently over the murdered monstrosity, and she moved very close to the still paralyzed Jazai. The woman spoke with a voice as hard as slate. You should be able to slip free of the crimson squares in a few minutes. The magic will dissipate relatively quickly now that the queen's demon is dead. Who are you? Her pitch-dark savior didn't answer, but instead silently paced the rocky walls of the cave, brushing her fingers against them, unbothered by the heat. She seemed almost to be reading the stones that surrounded her, expecting them to yield up their secrets. Meanwhile, Josiah felt control of her own body blessedly returning. She looked up and saw that, indeed, the baneful red-right angles that had mystically contained her were dimming, the scarlet energies slowly vanishing into the selfsame nothingness whence they'd originated. Josai attempted once again to engage her obsidian companion. While I appreciate the rescue, friend, I am compelled to chide you for your dishonorable tactics. You broke the law of the jungle, which states, never cheat, never lie, Never stab your foe in the back. That may work for this realm of yours, Josiah, but where I come from, sometimes compromises are necessary. You know who I am. I know a lot of things. I know the queen made off with a mystical gem. Yes, to my eternal burning shame, I failed to stop her. No shame in that. Got here too late myself. But that's only one piece of the puzzle. What do you mean? In New York City, the blueprints for an experimental piece of equipment are stolen. Meanwhile, during a tour of those new American frontier settlements on the moon, a world-renowned composer is kidnapped. Seemingly random events. But when looked at through the proper set of eyes, a pattern can be seen overlaying it all, and a name. Project Uncreate. How do you know these things? Call it a sixth sense. Of course! Now I realize who you are. The legendary detective known only as the Lady in Black. Amongst my fellow jungle denizens, I have heard odd whispers of your legendary battle with the villain who called himself Lucifer. Called himself? <laughs> That's cute. What are you saying? Not important. How very enigmatic. I like my secrets. I don't put every aspect of my... personality on display the way you do. No judgment. Mind you. The Beetle Queen spoke of taking a ship off of this island. Perhaps there is still time to catch her. Afraid not. She's long gone. And we'll need help before we go after her. We? You and I are taking a trip to New York, Josai. I am the jungle's protector. I should remain here. Please, princess. You know as well as I do that the Onyx Gem of Zavanu poses a threat to all humanity. In that context, the whole world is your jungle. So, an alliance? The lady in black held out a gloved hand. 
After a pause, Josiah took the hand in her own. Very well. Lead the way, lady in black. Doc Danger and the Danger Squad, Part 5, Assault on the Moon Base. Satellite Sally took a step back, her tooled leather boots crunching the moon dust beneath her feet. With the ever-loyal Claire de Lune at her side, she stared up at the massive structure before them. It was a veritable lunar castle, its large domed center flanked on all sides by silvery towers. The two cowgirls were silent for a bit as they took in the sight, the only sound being the occasional blip coming from the tracking unit Claire held. Finally, Sally broke the silence. So he's in there somewhere? Hoo-wee! This is one elaborate moon fort. According to the tracker, Von Hesslington is on the south side of the structure. Hand me that contraption, Claire. Now, you'll break in on the north side and draw the fire of any security. While they're all distracted, I'll bust in on the south side and rescue our hogtied musician. Well, that's... Wait! Why can't you draw their fire and I'll free the hostage? I'm the one who knows what he looks like. Oh, darn it, Claire. How many times do I have to remind you? You're the sidekick. I'm in charge. Say it with me. You're in charge. I mean, I will... Oh, no, wait for me. I'm You're in... in... Oh, sorry. <sighs> Dang, nab it. Okay. One, two, three. You're I'm in, in charge. charge. Good. Now get a move on, little buddy. Sally watched her partner head off to the north and smiled. She knew Claire could handle what came next. Now ask any cowgirl or boy when there's a foe to destroy. The first step is deploy. An effective decoy Picture her stalking the halls of this baleful moon base Until suddenly she and Miss Dreadful have come face to face But now Claire, she's a jewel Always keeps her cool So she'll challenge that fool to a laser gun duel. Oh me, I can see that showdown in my mind's eye. The air is so still while the earth shines full in the sky. Now I'd bet on Claire as long as Penny plays fair. I almost wish I was there. But I must be elsewhere. Well, Penny, I hope that I didn't leave too large a bruise. Now the duel is all over. I win and it looks like... As Claire felt consciousness ebbing away from her prostrate form, she could see Penny Dreadful standing over her, smiling a crooked smile. Beside the bandit was a strange robotic figure, its extremities still crackling after having sent a bolt of electricity through Claire's own brain. Her last thought, before passing out, was the intimation of a sinister alignment of forces, the ramifications of which could mean disaster not only for a pair of cowgirls on the moon, but for the entire world as well. To be continued. <laughs>